At the end of May and the beginning of June, the British army was in disarray. Its forces pushed to the very edge of a continent, thousands of men waited on the beaches of northern France, praying for safe passage back to a United Kingdom on the verge of defeat. Less than a year into the war and the Allied forces had already been routed. It would take a miracle to stave off a swift Axis victory in Europe. But you probably know all of this already. You've probably seen Fionn Whitehead and Tom Hardy telling the same story in Christopher Nolan's superb 2017 movie. You've probably seen Gary Oldman delivering the immortal words of Churchill, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, and scooping an Oscar in the process. And even if you haven't, you probably still know a fair bit about the events of these desperate few days, and you certainly know how it all turned out. So let's look at something a little different. Let's explore some of the great escapes that were even more remarkable than that of Dunkirk in 1940, those times when units faced almost certain destruction and somehow prevailed. In the latest edition of The Front, we're shining a light on some of those lesser known miracles and uncovering some pretty remarkable stories in the process. Thanks for joining us. Spring 1941, and the mood in Greece is uneasy, but positive. The previous autumn, Benito Mussolini had startled everyone, including his own ally Hitler and even his own generals, by launching a surprise attack on the Greek mainland. The aim? To solidify control over the eastern Mediterranean as Italian forces advanced into Egypt, and to show Hitler that Italy was very much an equal partner in the Axis struggle. He will find out in the papers that I have occupied Greece, Mussolini said. In this way, the equilibrium will be re-established. The reality? Crushing defeat after only a week of fighting. Thousands of troops lost, and the destruction of almost half the Italian fleet after a British carrier attack at Taranto. The Greeks were victorious. The Italians were on the back foot, pursued into Albania and the Balkans by a Hellenic counteroffensive. By early 1941, German troops stationed in Bulgaria were running raids into northern Greece, but these tended to be small scale and were dealt with quickly by the defenders. And now, the Allies were coming. British, Australian, New Zealander, Palestinian and Cypriot troops began landing in Greece in March. Things were looking good. Greece would stand strong. But Hitler wasn't going to repeat the strategic mistake of the Italians. The northern raids were just a prelude, and on April 6th, Germany launched a devastating double-pronged attack that would take out both Greece and Yugoslavia to the north. There were now almost 60,000 British and Imperial troops in Greece, along with 300,000 local defenders. But bearing down on those defenders were 680,000 Germans, along with 565,000 Italians back to redeem themselves after a disastrous campaign the previous autumn. Supported by a seemingly endless barrage from the Luftwaffe, the Axis victory was decisive and swift. The fist of the Luftwaffe smashed into the strategically vital port of Pyrrhus in only the first day of fighting. The Allies, already desperately outnumbered, struggled with the logistics of dealing with the mountainous terrain, as well as the poor transport infrastructure and lack of communication with local forces. Yugoslavia fell quickly, cutting off Greek troops as they took the fight to the Italians in the north. Greece itself wasn't far behind. On April 21st, Lieutenant General Sir Maitland Wilson began the evacuation of Allied forces. Some 50,000 troops were evacuated as the Axis forces tore into them. In the chaos, many were left behind, fighting on or evading capture as individuals and small groups, aided with bravery and resourcefulness by Greek resistance and civilians. More than half of those evacuated found themselves on Crete, the largest of the Greek islands, 300 kilometers south of Athens. The exhausted evacuees barely had a chance to catch their breath. Blitzkrieg meant no let up, no relent, and German paratroopers made sure of this, pressing home the advantage with an airborne invasion of the island. Major General Bernard Freiburg, a New Zealander, had been wrong-footed by intelligence that suggested an amphibious element to the coming invasion. 
immediately, he found his forces on the retreat. But this retreat would be a fighting one. Allied forces kept the invaders at bay as they moved southwards, while Colonel Robert Laycock and his comrades fought a desperate supporting action. For the Allies, the priority was now to get as many soldiers off the island as possible. Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham and his fleet exposed themselves to enormous danger, keeping the southern evacuation routes open and preventing German reinforcements from landing, while Greek soldiers, aware that there would be no escape for them, fought with astonishing bravery at places like Alikianos, keeping the Germans back while Allied troops retreated to the port of Svikia. Other Allied troops performed acts of heroism too, including the 28th Māori Battalion, as well as the units left behind to defend the port until the last. 16,000 men would be extracted from Crete, as the last bastion of Greece fell to the Axis powers. Not everyone in Denmark and Norway in April of 1940 felt that Nazi occupation was such a bad thing. For right-wing groups and for individuals whose politics aligned with that of the invaders, this was a new dawn for Scandinavia and for Europe. Nazi High Command, keen to bolster their ranks with new divisions and new soldiers, recognized this and launched recruitment campaigns that leaned heavily on the Viking heritage of the region and on the idea of Scandinavian and Germanic Aryans fighting side by side. This is how, in February 1942, thousands of Scandinavian volunteers found themselves in the German ranks, in the uniforms of the elite SS in Soviet Russia, and pinned down by the Red Army. Demyansk is a quiet town in Russia's Novgorod Oblast. Today, it's home to around 5,000 people, but in those early months of 1942, those numbers were considerably greater. The Soviet forces in the area numbered up to 400,000 alone, and by the time they encircled the region on February 8, 1942, there were six German divisions at Demyansk, including the Scandinavian SS men and the 3rd SS Panzer Division Totenkopf, totaling around 100,000 Axis soldiers. The Germans had asked for permission to retreat. This permission had not been granted, and now they were stuck. Stuck, maybe, but not completely abandoned. The Luftwaffe mobilized a frightening array of resources as they kept the Demyansk pocket supplied and ready for action. This meant the defenders could fortify in a big way, building the defenses that would keep them alive and hopefully counterbalance the numerical advantage of the Soviets. It worked, at least temporarily. The defenses held out, and Luftwaffe transport planes made daily sorties into the pocket, resupplying and reinforcing the troops who held Demyansk. More than 32,000 of these sorties would be flown in the salient over the course of its occupation. In fact, the balance of fighting even began to tip in the Germans' favor. A brutal action to secure the village of Ramoshevo would see more than 3,500 Nazi soldiers killed and many more wounded or captured. Opening up the Ramoshevo Corridor, appropriately known as the Corridor of Death, would be a huge psychological, tactical and logistical victory for the Nazi troops in the pocket, enabling more effective resupply and bolstering their chances of survival. But this was 1942. The German invasion of the Soviet Union may have been a bloody affair, but it had not yet stalled. 1943 would be very different. It could be argued that the early successes in the Demyansk pocket set a bad precedent for Germany's forces. The commanders in the field had requested permission to retreat. Hitler denied the request, and Hitler had been right. German forces would not give up ground in the USSR. So when the request came in to retreat from Stalingrad, it was denied again, and the result was a disaster for the Germans. The Red Army was now on the offensive and Demyansk was in its sights. With Stalingrad now gone, the German divisions at Demyansk were in disarray. The Luftwaffe was now stretched to breaking point. Resupply was difficult, and the Red Army was free to bring down its full might upon the defenders. But Ramoshevo was still open, and so, in February 1943, the defenders made a break for it. They fled the town, rigging the Ramoshevo corridor of death with mines as they did so a final parting gift for the advancing Soviets. Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union 
is one of the big talking points of World War II. We tend to view it now as an enormous tactical blunder and one of the early nails in the coffin of the Third Reich. But for over a year, the Demjansk pocket was successfully held up by Nazi forces while also inflicting sickening losses on the Red Army that were between 2.5 and 4.5 times greater than those inflicted on the defenders. While German forces remained in Demjansk, a huge section of the Wehrmacht was essentially immobilized, limiting operations elsewhere along the front. The Demjansk pocket also prevented any effective end of the siege at Leningrad. The German forces would never enter Leningrad. Demjansk and Rabushevo were bloodbaths, the scenes of some of the most vicious fighting on the Russian front. But for a short time, the dogged defense of the pocket and the corridor of death served as a real thorn in the side of the Red Army, who would be denied, at least temporarily, the catharsis of a final victory by the Germans' miraculous escape in 1943. Germany calling, Germany calling. So began the nightly broadcasts of William Joyce, the Brooklyn-born, Irish-raised mouthpiece of Nazi propaganda. Sometime academic, sometime street brawler, an alleged spy for the British forces in Ireland, and a target for assassination by the IRA, Joyce had already lived quite a life by the time war broke out in Europe. Now known as Lord Haw Haw by the British public, Joyce delivered news of Axis victories and Allied defeats, news that was frequently softened or censored by official channels like the BBC. As the Axis noose tightened around the besieged city of Tobruk in North Africa, Joyce had little sympathy for the defenders there. They're caught like rats in a trap, he said. They will live like rats, and they will die like rats. The Australian troops, on learning of their comparison to rodents and vermin, were amused. The rats of Tobruk, as they now called themselves, would prove very difficult to eradicate. In February 1941, an animal of a very different kind was advancing eastwards across Libya. Erwin Rommel, nicknamed the Desert Fox, was busy making up ground lost after a blundering Italian campaign in the region. The speed of the advance caught the Allied defenders unaware, and Agadabia and Zuitania quickly fell, followed by a string of defeats as the British and Commonwealth forces fell back toward the Egyptian border. By April 9th, Axis troops reached Tobruk. By April 11th, they were on the Egyptian frontier. In less than two months, the Allies had been pushed out of Libya, almost. While the Axis advance swept toward Egypt, it had stalled at Tobruk. The rats were in their trap, but that trap wasn't about to swing shut just yet. Tobruk may have remained standing, but it was isolated and almost completely surrounded. What's more, Rommel, aware that leaving the deep water port in Allied hands would not go down well with Nazi command back in Berlin, was turning his attention to the garrison. April 16th saw a major Italian offensive, but the rats held firm, driving the assailants back. By the end of the month, German and Italian troops were battering the city and its garrison with artillery. A second offensive pushed deep into Allied-held territory, capturing strategic positions until a minefield halted the advance. Australian troops pushed back with a counter-offensive, but this too was met with staunch resistance and ultimately failed. The situation looked dire for the defenders of Tobruk, but there was a lifeline, the Mediterranean Sea. The Royal Navy still held the upper hand and throughout an oppressive Saharan summer, kept the defenders supplied, eventually rotating some of the Australian and Indian troops out of the line, replacing them with Polish and Czech units that had escaped their occupied homelands to continue to fight with the Allies. Isolated on land, annihilation was a real possibility. With the Royal Navy in support, escape was also an option. Despite this, the defenders held out. A breakout in November joined up the defending force with the Allied lines in the east, and the siege was lifted, but only momentarily. Rommel was soon back on the offensive. By the spring of 1942, Tobruk was in danger of being isolated once again. A significant defeat at the Battle of Gazala drove the Allied 8th Army back toward Egypt, and communications housed in the National Archives in London 
show that the British High Command was under no illusion as to what would come next. Tobruk is still fighting, but must fall soon, said General Auchinleck in a telegram to Winston Churchill dated June 19th. We have hopes that the bulk of stores there have been destroyed. Enemy now stronger than we are in all types of troops essential for battle in open country and is well provided with transport. Now, with nowhere to go, the defenders of Tobruk faced up to the truth. Two days after Auchinleck's telegram, Tobruk fell. 32,000, or 45,000 according to Rommel, allied troops who had fought bravely and tenaciously for months were captured. Along with the fall of Singapore earlier that year, Tobruk was one of the biggest blows suffered by British and Commonwealth forces during the war. Life as a chindit was tough. Fighting in thick jungle and sweltering heat, often outnumbered and outgunned by a ruthless enemy, the men of this extraordinary division found themselves enduring some of the harshest conditions of the war, and earning themselves a name that would live on for generations. But for the men operating behind enemy lines in Japanese-occupied Burma, now Myanmar, in 1943, the idea of a lasting legacy would have been little comfort. These British and Indian troops were among the best soldiers in the Pacific theater, selected by Major Ord Wingate to join a new brigade designed for long-range operations. Guerrilla tactics, destruction of military hardware and infrastructure, and a complete denial of safety and security for the enemy, even far beyond his own lines, these were the aims of the game, and the objectives for Operation Longcloth. For the individual troops themselves, the objectives may have been a little simpler. Win the war, and stay alive. In both instances, this was easier said than done. On top of the brutality of their terrain and their enemy, the Chindits were operating under strict rules. Wounded soldiers, and there were plenty of those, were to be left behind, on the orders of Major Wingate. While these orders were not always followed, policies of constant movement and forward progress meant large numbers of soldiers and small detachments became divided and went into hiding behind enemy lines, trickling back to the Chindwin River and the border with India. This was not Wingate's only controversial decision. The Major was known for his eccentricity and his tendency to swiftly and unexpectedly change his plans. In March of 1943, Wingate issued an order. Longcloth was over and the Chindits were to withdraw. The squad commanders were to fall back westwards to India, all except one. One column did not receive this order, they received a different one. Continue east toward new objectives even further beyond the Japanese lines. For the men of that column, this must have been a difficult situation. They had advanced to the very limits of air support range and were in danger of being completely cut off out in the Burmese jungle. Japanese forces were massing in the area and the danger of annihilation was growing high. Finally, the weary and battle-broken men of the column made their way back toward India as hope for successful operations faded. But something stood in their way, the Irrawaddy River the vast watercourse that snakes its way down through northwestern Myanmar, past the ancient temples at Pagan, headed for the Indian Ocean. The Japanese understood the importance of crossing the Irrawaddy, and they watched the river like hawks, waiting for the beleaguered Chindits to make a break for it. The only chance for survival was to break into smaller groups. Slowly, covered by nightfall or by bad weather, Irregular detachments of men crossed the Irrawaddy and made the Indian border beyond. By April, most of the survivors had made it back, although many had not. Some troops, cut off from their escape route, broke north for China, linking up with Allied and Chinese forces stationed in the southwestern province of Yunnan. Others remained in Burma, hiding out in the northern mountains, beyond the reach of the Japanese occupiers. Of the 3,000 men sent over the Burmese border by Ord Wingate in January 1943, more than 800 would never make it back, dying from wounds or illness out there in the jungle. A further 600 would be in such bad condition after their escape that they could not return to active service. And yet still, somehow, the Chindits regrouped. Those men who fell back desperately in ones and twos and threes 
who crossed the Irrawaddy by night or broke for China would live to fight another day in one of the war's most famous units. The Sudjeska is quite a sight to behold. An idyllic river snaking between the Zelengora or Green Mountain and the Maglik, Voloyak and Bayoch peaks, the Sudjeska cuts an enormous scar around 1200 meters deep in places into the landscape of eastern Bosnia and Herzegovina. Sudjeska literally means gorge or canyon in Serbian. This haunt of hikers, rock climbers and assorted adventurers was once the scene of one of the most remarkable battles of the Balkan campaigns and a turning point for the war in Yugoslavia. The heroic deeds that took place in the canyon that have become part of the folklore of Yugoslavia were dramatized in the epic film Sudjeska in 1973 and still hold enormous significance today, even long after the breakup of the country. Yugoslavia fell to rapid Axis advance in 1941, and the newly autonomous Croatia became an important Axis partner in the region. Despite the swift capitulation, German and Italian troops faced a major headache across the Balkans. The partisans of the Yugoslav National Liberation Army and their leader, Josip Broz Tito. Shattering the NLA and neutralizing Tito were high on the agenda for Nazi High Command, who launched Fallweiss, or Case White, in January 1943 in an attempt to achieve exactly this. Case White failed, but was followed up in May of that year by Fallschwarz, or Case Black. Hitler was not about to let Case Black fail as Case White had. He urged all units to use every means in this battle, without limits against women and children as well if it leads to success. A vast German force began moving into partisan-held territories, including the 7th SS Volunteer Mountain Division Prince Eugen. Alongside them were seven Italian divisions, as well as forces from two more Axis nations, Bulgaria and Croatia. In total, 127,000 Axis troops, supported by eight artillery regiments and 300 aircraft, would crush the partisan resistance. Opposing them were four partisan divisions, accompanied by the 6th Proletarian Brigade and the 15th Majevica Brigade. Only around 11,000 of the 15,000 resistors, less than a tenth of the forces massed against them, were in fighting condition. The vice tightened almost immediately. German and Italian units pushed in from the west and south, driving the partisans from their bases in Montenegro and southern Bosnia. Meanwhile, Bulgarian and Croatian troops, accompanied by more Italian and German regiments, squeezed the partisans from the north. The PLA troops were completely outnumbered and almost totally cut off. Encirclement is not so simple in the rugged mountain landscape of southern Yugoslavia. The Axis formed a ring around the partisan positions, but only a tenuous one. Tito and his men understood this, and they recognized that their first priorities must be to secure their headquarters and the central hospital where 4,000 wounded and ailing troops were being treated. On May 22nd, they achieved this. The first proletarian division, fighting like ghosts in the desperate terrain, defeated German units near the village of Celebici, buying the partisans a little breathing space. Two days later, buoyed by their success at Celebici, the first proletarian turned its attention to the 118th Jäger division, in the hope of forcing a breakout near the town of Focha, just north of where the Sutjeska flows into the Drina. The first proletarian failed, but their brothers in the second proletarian division had more success. They took control of the Vucevo mountains and held it against German counterattacks. Control of the Vucevo meant control of the Sutjeska valley, and on May 25th, Tito and the partisan command formulated a new plan. They would break out at Fucevo and up the Sutjeska Valley. By the end of the month, the partisan divisions had regrouped. Now, they would open the corridor of the Sutjeska Valley. Perhaps control is a bit of a grand term for what the partisan divisions had actually achieved, and ferocious battles raged on both sides of the river as the NLA units, aided by a British military mission that arrived on May 27th, fought desperately to clear an escape route. By now, the Axis forces knew full well what was going on. Eager to make their breakthrough while there was still time, 
proletarian divisions pushed across the Sutjeska and over Zelengora, while the 3rd Shock and 7th Banya divisions would retreat across the Tara River with the Central Hospital. Now, men of all ranks, of all standings, must fight. Tito himself was wounded. The British Captain Stuart was killed, as was Sava Kovacevic, commander of the 3rd Shock Division, as his men failed to cross the Tara. In the fight to get away, all of the partisan divisions suffered at least 30% casualties. The 7th Division suffered almost 53%. As attacks faltered and soldiers succumbed to injury or exhaustion, only small groups were able to break through the Axis lines, trickling out beyond the encirclement and into the relative safety of the East. Many would not make it. Many could not even muster the strength to try. German troops began to hunt down these shattered pockets, routing them out with dogs and shooting those they found, around 1,200 in total. On the Piva mountain, 700 sick and wounded partisans hid from the Nazi search parties, tended to by their Yugoslav nurses who had stayed behind. Most would be summarily executed on Piva along with the nurses. If this was a victory for the NLA, it was a Pyrrhic one. Their dead littered the valleys and hillsides of Sutjeska and their divisions had been ripped to shreds. But this was a turning point all the same. Many lived to fight another day and the Axis had been taught the important lesson that encirclement does not work on this kind of battlefield. The NLA and the Allies would taste victory in time and Tito would become one of the 20th century's most famous leaders. The men and women we've discussed in this video came from both sides of the conflict and from all corners of the globe. Yet all shared one thing. When confronted with horror, they maintained their hope. Even though these stories deal largely with escape, with survival, this isn't true in every case. In each instance, sickening numbers of soldiers and civilians laid down their lives for a cause that seemed lost and continued to resist even when all seemed futile. Most of us, mercifully, can't begin to imagine what that must feel like. Hopefully we'll never have to. But what do you think? Which of these represents the most miraculous of escapes and survival against all the odds? We'd love to hear your thoughts, and if there are any other wartime great escapes you think we should cover, just let us know in the comments section below. As always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.